All right. Well, the last time we were together, I shared my story, my cancer story. And I shared a little bit about um, the diagnosis part and about the um, just the things you go through whenever you get a report from a doctor. And uh, sometimes the words of a doctor can be so weighty and they can say things and some way or another when they say it, it can it can just be like powerful and it shouldn't be more how many know God's word is the most powerful God right so we need to prioritize and put a priority on God's word so tonight I just kind of wanted to share a little bit more and share some of the scriptures that were a real help to me and maybe some practical things that were of help to me one of the things that I shared last week that the doctor told me the first time we met he said Tom you're going to deal with disease but think about it you're also going to deal with dis-ease Anytime you're dealing with a diagnosis, there's some discomfort, meaning it can affect you emotionally or it can affect you in your frame of thought and how you're viewing life. And he said, so there's really two different battles people deal with. That's the literal disease, and then there's just the disease, how it affects your peace and what have you. Fortunately, I had a believing doctor, and we talked about the Lord, and he's very supportive that way. And um, so... You know, when you minister to people that are going through a season in their life, you got to realize you're kind of dealing with two different areas. One is you're dealing with the diagnosis, the medical issue, and then you're just dealing with the psychological or the mental or the thought life that they're dealing with. And so it's really important that we're sensitive to them. Another thing, I'm just going to throw out some things tonight on maybe how you can help people that are going through uh, this season of their life. You know, one thing I would say is, um, you know, you can get a lot of unsolicited advice when you go through seasons of like this. Does that make sense? You can have a lot of people that want to, they mean well, and they really want to help you. And it can be family, and it can be friends, and it can be people that are wanting to help you. But, you know, I would just encourage you, if you know somebody that's going through a battle in their life you know it's probably best just to wait until they open a door for your advice than for you to be too quick to say well let me tell you what you need to do have you ever discovered not everybody likes you mapping their life out have you discovered that and sometimes people can feel as if well hey I want to tell you what to do here and don't go to that doctor go to this doctor you need to quit going to this hospital you need to go over here to that doctor And, you know, I believe there's safety in the multitude of counsel, but I also believe this, there can be confusion in the multitude of counsel. And that is you can get so many voices going on that it can be kind of overwhelming. And um, so I I had people that were giving me advice, and, you know, some I know is well-intended. And one day I was praying, and I said, now, Lord, what am I supposed to do here? You know, I mean, this person's recommending this, this person's recommending this. And I heard the Lord say this to me in my spirit. I heard the Lord say down in my heart, are you going to listen to me or are you going to listen to them? And I knew what he was saying. Tom, you're going to have to pick a lane here. Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to me or are you going to listen to them? And I thought, Lord, that's it. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to you. And I already knew in my heart that for me, I was supposed to go through treatment. And I'm not saying that's the path for everybody, but in my case, the Lord made it abundantly clear, you need to go through this chemotherapy treatment. So I had total peace about it. I felt like I'd heard from the Lord. And one thing that was funny was, I got about halfway through it, and I told Sharon that night, I said, Sharon, I'm done. I'm not going to continue this. I'm not going to keep doing this. I'm done. And so, uh, have you ever had your head set on something and then the Bible changed your mind? (laughs) And so I said, I'm done. I'm done. And so I got up one night and uh, I'm I'm walking out of our bedroom, walking down the hall. And I I don't know what I was even going to do, but I was walking down the hall. And I can take you to the place in our hallway where the Lord gave me a scripture. And the scripture he gave me is Romans chapter 12 and verse number 12. And this is what he said to me. He said, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. That's Romans 12, 12. And the Lord said to me, Tom, I want you to rejoice in hope. And then this word stuck out, be patient in your tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. So I told my oncologist this story. 
And I told him, you know, I got this word. I just feel like this is the scripture I'm standing on. When Debbie went and saw him not too long ago, Debbie said, he memorized that scripture. <laughs> he said, I think that's the perfect scripture for so many of my patients. They need to be reminded of that. So what I'm getting at is, you know, sometimes we can get weary and well-doing, or we can be doing the right thing, we get discouraged in it, but we just have to hang in there. We have to be determined. We have to be um, consistent. So, you know, for me, the Lord spoke with me, and I got scriptures, and, and I will say this, people gave me re resources that were a blessing. Um, my mom gave me a book by a minister that, that had gone through a diagnosis and treatment, and one of the scriptures that he stood on that was a real blessing to me is Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 22. And it says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and it addeth no sorrow with it. And when he was going through, in his case, radiation treatment for throat cancer, he said, I stood on that scripture, and my confession continually was, this treatment will be a blessing that doesn't bring me sorrow. This treatment will be a blessing that doesn't produce sorrow. Meaning, it's not going to long-term negatively impact my health. I'm believing it'll be a blessing that doesn't bring sorrow. How many know that's a good thing to believe for, right? And so that was my, my constant confession. Lord, thank you that this treatment will, it'll do what it's supposed to do, and it won't do all the stuff it's not supposed to do. And I felt like, you know, that was important that I stand that way. Proverbs 10, 27 was another one that I read through. I read through these scriptures on a, just a routine basis, meaning I just started at the beginning of them. I, initially, I didn't have that many scriptures, so I could read all of them in one day and then start the next day at the beginning of the list and go through the list. But what happened was I started adding and adding and adding, and so I, I couldn't get them all in one day. And so I would, you know, put a mark there and the next day pick up and kind of loop around time and time again. One of the scriptures that I stood on was Proverbs ten twenty seven. It says, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be cut short. And um, in other words, when you have a reverence for God, it will prolong your life. Walking with the Lord will be a blessing to you. But notice this, the years of the wicked will be cut short. I think a lot of times people have this idea that there's this predetermined length of days that you're going to live, and there's just nothing you can do about it. And usually Hebrews 10, 27 is the scripture they'll use. You know, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then after that, the judgment. And it's kind of like your life is set, and there's not a thing in the world you can do about it. You know, the Bible does tell children, if you'll honor your parents, it'll go well with you, and you'll live long on the earth. So there are things that we can do that'll affect the longevity of our life. And if you'll go through the book of Deuteronomy, that was one of the things that God kept telling the nation of Israel, I want it to go well with you, and I want it to go well with your children, and I want it to go well with your children's children. I mean, God was talking into future generations before they existed. And so, you know, the fear of the Lord, or the reverence for God will prolong your life. And God wants you to have a long life, a blessed life, and a full life. And this is another good one, Proverbs 10, here's another good one, Proverbs 17, 22. It says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. It does good like medicine. So this scripture didn't, it's an anti-medicine. It says, a merry heart will do you good just like medicine can do you good. So how many know it's important that we keep the right attitude, we have a joyful heart, we praise God? Now, I heard this statement years ago, and I thought it was good. And this guy made this statement. He says, you know, I have suffered many calamities in life that never happened. I've suffered a lot of calamities in life that never happened. And, you know, we've all done that, haven't we? At times you're kind of concerned about this or what about that or what about this. And the reality is it just didn't happen. And so, you know, a merry heart does good like a medicine. Rejoicing in the Lord, praising the Lord. It'll affect your immune system. It'll, it'll just keep you strengthened. And so I'll keep a merry heart through all my adversity. Jesus made the statement, in this world you're going to have tribulation but be of good cheer. In other words, the total opposite of what you think you would do, do the total opposite. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. Have you ever noticed that tribulations can be mood-altering? Correct? Tribulations typically, I mean, let's face it, that's just reality for 
the non-believing world is that tribulations are mood-altering problems, meaning I was this way until that happened. But Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Here was a great one that was a blessing to me. Proverbs 18, 14. It says, the strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble, but a weak and broken spirit, who can rise up, who can raise up or bear? I want to read that again. Proverbs 18, 14. The strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble, but a weak and broken spirit who can raise up or bear. So that first portion there, the strong spirit of a man will sustain him when he's in bodily pain. The most important thing any of us can do is keep your spirit strong. Do things to take care of the spirit man. You know, you can tell when you've been around people that are taking care of the outer man or the natural man. You can just tell. When you see people that are taking care of the natural man. But you know what? You can't always see it. But when people are taking care of their spirit life, it'll sustain them. They'll be able to make it through things that normally would crush other people. So we've got to condition our spirit. We've got to school that new man. That new man is recreated, but he needs to be educated. He needs to be schooled. He needs to be trained. He needs to be equipped with the Word of God. And so thank God that we can stay strong on the inside. Isaiah 8, 18, it says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts. So did you know God wants us and our children to be signs and wonders? And be a miracle. What is a sign? A sign points, right? It gives people direction. And God wants us to be for signs and wonders. And one confession that we can make in, in our mouth is that, Lord, my health is a sign and a wonder of the goodness of God. A sign and a wonder. You know what wonders do? They make people wonder, don't they? How did that happen? It was God. It was God's goodness. Now, what you have to do when you're going through challenges is you've got to keep your mind renewed to these things because if you let the Word of God slip, as it says in Hebrews 3.1, if you allow the Word of God to slip, your faith level starts going down. In other words, you can be so strong, you're so confident, you're fully assured, but when the Word starts slipping from your thought life and you're not keeping your mind renewed to the Word of God, then all of a sudden you can be like James said, you're like a man that's on the sea tossed with the wind. He's a double-minded man. In other words, one moment he's here and the other minute he's here. And the Bible says, let not that man think he will receive anything from the Lord. And so it is important that we keep our mind focused on God's Word and we don't vacillate, but we stay with that. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Well, that's what God says to us. Fear not, I'm going to be with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, God can be with us, and he is with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But you know, Jesus was with the disciples, but they still got into fear. Does that make sense? Jesus was with them whenever he walked on the water, but they still got into fear. Just because the Lord is with you doesn't automatically mean you're going to walk above fear. You can have awareness of his presence, but you still have to cast down those vain imaginations. One of the most challenging times um, I'd gone and they said, we want to do a high dose um, chemo treatment. We want to just put you in the hospital. Just three days, Tom, three days. Well, they put me in for three days and that three days stretched out to seven days. And they said, you know, I was only out of the pulpit twice and this was one of them. And, um, and they said, you know, this, sorry, you know, kind of not, not sorry, but, you know, this kind of went different than what we were expecting. And, and there was a, a nurse there at the hospital that was a godly woman that loved the Lord. And she came in and whenever some of the concerns they had about my health and how my body was reacting to the chemo, 
the nurse came in and I said, so what's going on? She goes, oh, it's, you know, she started describing what was happening. And then she, and then I said, well, you know, I'm going to pray about this. And, and I could tell she was a believer. And you know how you're expecting somebody to say, oh, I'm going to pray with you. But you know, she said something that was the biggest faith killer. And you know what she said? But we must pray God's will would take place. Oh, my Lord. It, what, that was the first time in my life that I thought, if you're really in a tough spot and somebody comes up to you and says, but we must pray that it would be the will of God, that doesn't help you any. <laughs> if anything, I'll be honest with you, it really hurts you. Because then all of a sudden you're thinking, well, maybe this isn't the will of God. You know, I didn't think that, but I'm thinking, you can just keep that. How many know Jesus is the will of God in action? Jesus is the will of God. If you want to know what God is like, if you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen my Father. In fact, I and my Father are one, Jesus said. His name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. So if you want to know what the will of God is like, look at Jesus, because the Bible says in Hebrews 1 that he is the fullness of the Godhead deity. I mean, he is the fullness of God. He is the exact representation, is what Paul said. So anyway... I learned something that night, and that is people can mean well, and I know she meant well, but still, that wasn't helpful. Y'all, we have to be unequivocal. We have to be 100% resolute. We have to be emphatic, and that is Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and 2,000 years ago, he never met anybody and said, it's just flat, not my will. How many know that? And he never looked at anybody and said, you're too old to get in on this. You know, Jesus wants people well. I mean, he, he paid a bigger price than anybody. And the cross is a double cure. The same cross that took all your sin, the same body that took all your sin also took your diseases. Right? And so you have to drill that. You have to get that in your spirit. You have to know that. And let me tell you, you don't build foundations in rainstorms. You don't go out and dig footings when it's 10 inches of rain forecasted this week. You dig the footing, you lay a foundation during the good times. You see, you just keep feeding your faith all the time. Now, E.W. Kenyon, you know, who had a church in Washington, I believe it was, and, you know, he had a curriculum for the youth, for the children, for all age groups, and he mandated, we're going to teach on healing at least once a year. We want to go through it because we want all the kids to get the same thing the parents are getting because we want to raise up a whole generation where they're emphatic and they're absolute knowing Jesus is a healer. And so it's important that we get that. Now, does everybody receive? No. Is everybody born again? No. But was it the will of God? Did God really want them to get saved? Yes. So you can't pin the fact that somebody didn't receive from the fact that it wasn't the will of God. Because, see, God really wants. And I believe if we're willing to make whatever adjustment, whatever, whatever we need to do on our end, that there's reception. There is healing that flows. And it's the same Greek word. It's the same word for salvation, the new birth, as we know it, the rege regenerated spirit with being healed in your body. So I refuse to be fearful and dismayed. The Lord is strengthening me every day in every way. You know, God is strengthening us. And we can talk about that. Lord, thank you. I receive your strength. Now, a lot of times people would say, I'm praying for you, Pastor. Oh, I heard that a lot from all over. You know, all over. I had Czech pastors praying for me. I had people in Guatemala praying for me. I had people all over this nation, people praying and, you know, just naturally speaking, this thought came through my mind. If I were in a prayer line and, and somebody was praying for me, I would want to be in a receiving mode. In other words, if I was in a prayer line and some minister was coming through and they were laying hands praying, you know, probably if they were praying for me, I wouldn't be on my phone. Does that make sense? If they were praying for me, I wouldn't be just kind of disengaged, but I would be in a receiving mode. There were times I'd say, Lord, I know a lot of people are praying, and I receive those prayers in the name of Jesus. I receive those, Lord. I receive strength. I receive well, everything that's going on. I, I receive those prayers. I'm in a receiving mode. I'm receiving what you're pouring out today. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25 
This is in the Amplified. It says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance, and let us plead together, declare thou, that thou mayest be justified. Remind me of your merits with a thorough report. Let us plead and argue our case together. State your position that you may be proved right. Now, declare thou that thou mayest be justified as the King James. But it's a picture of God really asking us, lay it out there for me. Plead your case. Put it out there. You know, and that's a picture of Abraham interceding. Picture of Moses interceding for the nation of Israel. God says, hey, I'm done here. And God says, oh, Lord, come on. If you blot the, if you, if you uh, just wipe them out, then, you know, that's not going to be a good for the nation. All those Egyptian people are going to think that you didn't like them after all. And he interceded. Remind me. Plead your case. And that's exactly what I did. I mean, you just plead your case with the Lord. Lord, I I'm, I'm want to be exactly one of the cases I pled before the Lord was whenever Peter's mother-in-law was healed, she got up and she ministered unto the Lord. And I said, Lord, that's it. I'm going to get up and I'm going to minister. I'm going to be a greater blessing. I, I'm pleading my case. That's my goal. I'm, I want to be about kingdom business. And that's why I want health. You know, God wants us healthy, but, you know, it is good that we're like Peter's mother-in-law when we are restored to health. I heard one minister put it this way. How many know that God doesn't want to just heal us so we can sin without pain? How many believe that? <laughs> he wants us to be able to live for him to the glory of God, that whatever we do is done to the glory of God. Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 4, it says, Surely, and talking about Jesus Messiah, he hath borne our griefs, and the word griefs in the Hebrew, look it up, it's the word diseases, and carried our sorrows, and the word sorrows there is is the word translated pain and so we could say it this way surely he had carried our what he carried our sicknesses he carried them he bore our pain in life so you know we got to drill that in. it's already taken place it's a done deal it's already happened the transaction's already taken place y'all we're on the receiving end You know, I just recently got a new radio put in my car. If I got in there in the radio and I knew it was hooked up right and everything was right, but for whatever reason, and I'm positive the antenna's hooked up, I know everything's working right, but for whatever reason, I'm not getting the signals. You know, I'm probably not going to call all the radio stations in Oklahoma City and say, you guys are in collusion. You've blacked out my radio. I wouldn't do that. What I wouldn't call all the FM stations, all the AM stations, say, you guys are all working together. You have it as conspiracy against me. You're... Y'all, the problem is not on the broadcasting side. The problem is on the receiving side. And so, you know, sometimes when, when people are not receiving, like they want to pin it on God. God is not our problem. God is my answer. God is my best friend. And so what you need to do is realize that we've got to be on the receiving end. What can I do to receive? What can I do to just walk with a, a greater openness and a reception that the Word is working mightily in me? Isaiah fifty four seventeen, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shalt thou condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is, is of me, saith the Lord." And you say, Pastor, what did you glean out of this scripture? This helped me a lot. Because when I read this passage, I thought, just because the weapon has been formed doesn't mean that weapon is going to prosper. Does that make sense? That helped me because it was like, okay, there has been a weapon that's been sent my way, but, but the Bible doesn't say the weapon won't happen. It says the weapon won't prosper. And so, you know, that was a renewal of my mind. And I'm just giving you these scriptures, like I say, that I just went through on a circular basis, just meditating on, building my faith up through this period of time. And I want to say this, there were plenty of days that, you know, you're so weak. About seven to ten days after I had my treatment, you go through this period of about three days where 
I told Sharon the best explanation would be gravity is working like eight times stronger than normal today. Everything. One time I came up here to the church, I said, I'm going to the church to pray. And I came up here to the church to pray, and I was praying back in one room, and I was getting so cold, and I thought, oh, I need to turn the heater on. But there was only one problem. The thermostat was like, it, I would, would have, it would have required me to walk about 12 steps. I said, forget it. <laughs> I'll just stay here. In other words, you know, you're so tired during that period of time. But one of the things I would hold on to, Lord, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Yes, it's been formed, but it will not prosper in the name of Jesus. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. And you've got to say that. The word is going to prosper where you send it. Oh, pastor, I never even pray over my finances. Well, you should. Pastor, I don't even pray over those areas. Well, you might want to consider this because, see, wherever you send the word is where the word prospers. And so you, you speak that and you begin to say, Lord, I thank you today that your word will prosper whithersoever it is sent, whereunto it is sent. So, Lord, we speak the word over this situation. We thank you, Lord, for your word that is working in this situation. And then you have Isaiah chapter 58 and verse number 8 and 9 that says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward, or your reward, or your rear guard. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord will answer. Thou shalt cry, and he will say, Here I am. So the Lord is saying, your health will spring forth speedily. How many of all of us need to get that one on our tongues and keep you? Thank you, Lord, that our health will spring forth speedily. Oh, that's going to be a, that'll be a 10-month recovery. It doesn't have to be. You can, you can speak the word and say, Lord, I'm believing you to accelerate that. Oh, you know, it'll, it'll take you months and months and months. Now, this, you know, if I tell you this story, if God, God has to be glorified or it offends or it grieves the spirit, okay? So I went through chemo. 90 days after chemo, we went on a family vacation. My hair was coming back. Towards the end of it, your toenails start coming off. It's a wild ride, people. But I, I had it in my heart, go to Washington, D.C., I'm going to Washington, D.C. We loaded up the truck and we headed down. It wasn't Beverly, but it was Washington, D.C., okay? So we went to Washington, D.C. If you've ever been to Washington, D.C. in August, it's hot. <laughs> and we walked a lot. And I had one of these watches where you, you would know how long you watch. And in three and a half days, we walked 37 miles. And I thought to myself, Lord, that would have to be God. But here's what I'm saying. Y'all, you know, God can restore our health speedily. We can declare that. We can believe, Lord, you're accelerating the healing process. You're speeding up the healing process. And God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. Jeremiah 1.12 says, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. God is watching over his word to perform it. He's watching over the words that you speak to perform them. I remember one time years ago, I was praying over a new year, and I said, Lord, what are you going to do in this new year? What are you going to do in this new year? What are you Kind of like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And it was like the Lord put it right back on me. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? You know, it's not all about him just in his mystery doing things. There were people healed under the ministry of Jesus, and about 13 different times Jesus said this, your faith has made you whole. As you have believed, so be it done unto you. So it's not just God and his sovereignty up in heaven hitting people with the blessing gun. How many realize that? There's a part we play. We, we receive. We say, yes, Lord, I'm receiving what you've already poured out. I'm receiving from you, Father. So that's Jeremiah 30, 17 is another one. I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thy wounds. I'm restoring health unto thee. 
The Lord restores my immune system after each chemo treatment. He heals every wounded cell. Lord, thank you that you restore. You're restoring immune systems. And God's able to restore little cells in your body. Whatever it is you go through, Lord, thank you for restoring health unto me and healing my wounds. Years ago, we had this couple in our church. I was from a Methodist background, and they were tremendous influence. They're both up in heaven now. And she came to me one Wednesday night after church, and she said, Pastor, I'd like to receive communion, and I'd like for you to pray with me because I go in tomorrow because I've got these carotid arteries, and I need to have this surgery. And there was concern surrounding the procedure, the surgery. So we had communion together, and I prayed for him. And I will always remember, I was a young pastor, and as I'm praying for him, I knew the Lord gave me this scripture right here, Jeremiah 30, 17. God says, I'm going to restore health unto you, and I'm going to heal your wound. Y'all, that's a great one to remember. Jeremiah 30, 17. Put that, you know, keep that one and hold on to that. Daniel 3, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered the king and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We are not worried about what will happen. Now, I told you, December the 15th, that year I was up here praying. They just told me a week earlier you're going to go through chemical treatment. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, what's this going to look like? And I'm praying, I'm seeking the Lord. And the Lord said, Tom, he just kept, he had already been dealing with me about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for over a month. And, and I knew that the Lord was talking to me about a fire. And it was like the Lord was, kept telling me, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't afraid of the fire. Don't be afraid of this treatment. And the living bible you know before there was the new living translation there was the living bible and it says this in the living bible it says we are not worried about what will happen to us how many know god is involved in your storm he's right there and he's watching over your situation so don't be afraid of the fire daniel three twenty three, and these three men shadrach meshach abednego fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace then nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire and they answered and said unto the king true o king and he answered and said unto them lo i see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt or no damage and the form of the fourth is like the son of god now, here's the big thing I want you to remember. You know what the beautiful thing about your fiery furnace experience? You're not alone. The fourth man's right there with you. And he said this to them. He said, you know, they're in there, in this fiery furnace, and right in the middle of that fire, they're walking around, and they're not even hurt. And my confession was, Lord, thank you for keeping this any permanent damage due to the, my body due to chemotherapy. Lord, thank you that just like that fire didn't hurt their body, you know what I'm saying? The fire didn't permanently hurt them. They got out. Of, in fact, they didn't even smell like smoke. In fact, they didn't even lose their hair. Now, I think my faith wavered on that part, all right? But they, they were in the fire, and they got, now how many, of, how many of you in the last, say, six months, you've gone somewhere and had barbecue? Somewhere and you've had barbecue. Did you know when you have barbecue and you leave from there, you don't even have to tell people what you had for lunch that day. I mean, Sharon and I ate at Subway today, and you know, I mean, two hours later, I still smelt like that bread down there. In other words, just the atmosphere you're in, it has a way of getting off on you. They were in the fire, and they got out of the fire, and the Bible says they, they didn't even smell like smoke. So the Lord's able to keep you. Notice verse 30, 27 of that same chapter, Daniel 3, 27 says, The satraps and the prefects and the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men their hair was not singed their cloaks were not harmed and no smell of fire had come upon them you know what that means they were supernaturally protected 
Well, there's a place in God where we can say, Lord, thank you for supernatural protection. Thank you for supernaturally watching over us, keeping us. Lord, you're keeping us. You're keeping us from the flames. You're keeping us, Father, from no permanent damage being done. We stand on that. Now, let me tell you my best friend. Can I read you my scripture? That was my best friend. This was one of my best friends right here, Joel 3.10. This was my friend right here, Joel 3.10, the last line. Let the weak say, I am strong. How you doing? I'm strong in the Lord. I mean, you get to use that one a lot. How you doing? Well, the Bible says weak people are supposed to say they're strong, so I'm strong in the Lord. You know, that, that works better than how you doing? Oh, I'm weak as water. In fact, I'm getting weaker just talking to you right now. You know, we got to let the weak say I'm strong. Lord, I thank you that I'm strong. And, and Lord, I'm strong in the Lord. Joel 3.10. Let the weak say, I am strong. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. God alone gets all the glory. That was strong in my heart. Lord, I want you to get all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. I shared this last week, but it kind of bothered me when you'd hear people, we're going to do this, we're going to kick cancer, we're going to do this. I understand you need to have a strong desire and you need to have a strong determination. But how many know the, the reality is without God, we cannot heal a fly with a headache? Do you realize that? You can't. Without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. So it's not in and of ourselves. It's God in us. So we say, Lord, thank you. It's not by my mind. It's not by my power. But it is by the Spirit of the living God. Keep your faith up. Well, this is a long passage. It's Matthew chapter 4. And one of the things the Lord dealt with me was, Tom, the, the devil was overcome in the temptation in the wilderness that Jesus endured. The devil was overcome through words. It's words. I know it was God's word, but it was still a spoken word. He didn't think the word. He just didn't wish the word, but he literally spoke the word. And Jesus, for time and eternity, set an example for us. In other words, I'm going to give you an example of how you're supposed to overcome the enemy. And so the scripture talks about Jesus being led of the Spirit, went into the wilderness, and he was tempted, as you know the story. He fasted 40 days, 40 nights. Afterwards, he was hungry. The tempter came to him, and he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written. Everybody say, it is written. Now, Jesus did that for us. Say, so, Pastor, I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm going to be just real transparent with you, Pastor. It's hard for me to memorize real long passages of Scripture. Good news. Did you know Jesus didn't quote real long passages to the devil? He just said, it's written, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He didn't even quote the whole, the whole 91st song. He just, he just, boom. He spoke the word, Deuteronomy. You know, Deuteronomy. He, he had the word and he spoke it out, out of his mouth. And as he was speaking the word. Now, here's one of the things you deal with. In the early stages of anything, there's a lot of excitement. Isn't there a lot of excitement? You know, the early days of marriage. Are people excited? Oh, we just got married. I remember when we, Sharon and I first got married. We were on our honeymoon. We were in Colorado Springs. And I, I remember this. We were down the Royal Gorge, and this guy said, well, can I take your picture? I said, yeah, I'd love for you to take my So, you know, I had my picture with Sharon, and, and, I, 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 and he looked at me and goes, did y'all just get married? I go, yeah, yeah, we did just get married. How could you tell? He goes, well, your wedding band's real shiny. <laughs> well, like, really? Okay. How many know sometimes the shine can fade in marriage? Do you understand what I'm saying? People, like, they get excited, and then they kind of, they go through some things, and that joy they had, you know, isn't there. What, where, and, you know, sometimes in the fight of faith, people are like, oh, yeah, we're digging in. We're strong. We're going to be strong in the Lord through this. And then after about three months of it, you're like, oh, my Lord. And the Lord dealt with me like that. Tom, Jesus, it, it was, we don't know the increment. We don't know how the gaps between these, they could have been all together. Bam, 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 temptation. It could have been intermittently. 
But one of the things the Lord spoke with me through this, Tom, keep speaking the word. He didn't think it, he spoke it. Sp- get your mouth going, speak the word. Jesus spoke the word. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, that Thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they will bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Let the word do all the work. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now here's what most people do. They'll they'll say, I got the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I got the sword of the Spirit. Now, I understand what they're saying. This has the potential of being the sword of the Spirit. But, y'all, it's really not the sword of the Spirit. The word there, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The word word is the word rhema, and it's a revealed word, a spoken word. It's not the totality of Scripture, but it's a revealed word that you're speaking that word over a situation. And then the sword of your spirit can also be translated the the sword of your breath. So you need to speak it out. You need to articulate. And even if it's not very loud, I promise you, faith comes when you hear yourself speaking the word of God. Not only does it put the devil on the run, but Jesus, he he just said, "It's, it's it's settled. We're not doing this. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And Jesus said unto him, Get out of here. Get out of here. Get thee hence. You know, the, the Weiss translation, he says, Go and be going. Just keep going. Get on out of here. So we need to just realize that we just say, go, get out of here. We've got to be firm. We've got to be strong. But one of the things the Lord dealt with me, Tom, just like in a natural fight, you're in a fight of faith. Just like in a natural fight, the longer you're in a fight, boxers, they get tired. They quit throwing blows. They just take them. This situation, Jesus was weak. Jesus was physically going through a period of time here. He's son of man as well as son of God. But yet, don't keep speaking the word. Keep in your, in your time, just keep speaking that. So Jesus overcame the devil with words, and it is written will still work today. Can I get a good amen on that, all right? And it'll just help you. And he said, Pastor, I'm not good with locations. I can't always remember where those scriptures are. Have you ever noticed when you go through the book of Hebrews, who I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, you ever notice how many times Paul said, it is written somewhere, It hath been said, and some of it, 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 we think, that's Psalm 8.3, you should know that. What is man that thou art mindful of him? But it's like, you know, it has been said. Some translations, the ESV says, it is written somewhere. (laughs) How many know it is written somewhere is better than I don't have a clue what this is? You know, go ahead and speak it out. It helps you, I think, to know the locations but don't let that be a barrier for your speaking okay matthew 8 17 that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by isaiah the prophet himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses you know how i read isaiah 53 4 earlier and i said when you take those words and you translate them into the from the hebrew into other translations will talk about disease or sickness and it'll be translated pain Okay, in the New Testament, you have whenever the writers of the New Testament took that same passage, this is how they translated Isaiah 53, 4. They said, himself took our, what, infirmities and bore our, what, sicknesses. So he, they did exactly what I was talking about. So we've got to realize he's already done it. It is finished. It is done. We're on the receiving end. We're on the receiving end. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that healing is working. Thank you that healing is flowing. Thank you that the power of God is working. Matthew 11 and 12 says this, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violent, and the violent take it by what? Here's the amplified of that passage. Violent men seize it by force as a precious prize. So there has to be that fervency in our spirit there has to be that earnestness in our spirit 
Remember we used the word possess Sunday about how many times in Deuteronomy it says possess the promised land? Look it up in the Strong's Concordance. One of the first translations, literal translation of the word possess is the word seize. You're going to have to seize it. Take it. Grab hold of it. And we seize it and we say, Lord, that's mine. I take it right now in the name of Jesus. Okay, I'm going to give you some more. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am a gentle, I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what passage stuck out at me in this whole part there? was the part where it says, take my yoke and learn from me. And that was one of the things I kept, Lord, I'm learning from you. I'm learning from the master. That's what a disciple means, somebody that's sitting at the feet of a master. Lord, I'm learning from you on this. Help me, Lord, to grow. Help me to mature. Help me to develop. And I'm going to find rest in my soul. You know, the faith walk will not give you a nervous breakdown. Give me an amen on that. Now, the doubt walk will. But the faith won't, won't. And so you're going to have to enter into God's rest. Now you say, Pastor, wait a minute. You just got through talking about fighting a good fight of faith, and now you're talking about resting. How do you get those two scriptures to work together? You're fighting with an understanding we've already got the victory. Correct? It's like, no, I've, in the name of Jesus, I'm resting in what Jesus has already done. I know what he has already spoken, and I'm resting. But still, you've got to walk it out. We're an occupying army. The battle's been won, but we have to go in and possess the land. Matthew 18, Jesus said this, Verily I say unto you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you, if... Two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. It shall be done for them and my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. You need to have people that can agree with you. You need to have people that you can get in agreement with. I know one minister I respect, he said, you know, I drive 100 miles to find somebody I can get in agreement with. And then you need to have people that say, I'm in agreement and I'm not coming out of agreement. We're staying in agreement. In fact, every time this situation comes up, you and I are going to say it together. Thank you, Lord, that you're working in this. You know, whatever your agreement is. But you need to agree. Agree means you're saying the same thing. It's so important. This helped me so much. When Darren and Regina first heard what was going on, when Darren came to me, Sharon's brother came to me he said you know he didn't say well this is how I'm praying and this is how I'm believing and this is what you're going to this is what I'm going to put on you basically you know what he said Darren came to me and he said so how are y'all praying so we can get in agreement with that in other words how are y'all what where's your faith at so we can support that we can be in agreement with you and when Sharon heard that she said is that not wisdom that we think man you know, instead of I'm going to superimpose what I want to have, y'all, it's just better to find out. Now, you can raise people up, but in that moment, it's just a lot wiser to say, how can we get an agreement? How can I help you out? How can we get an agreement on this? And so, you know, there's a power of agreement. One plus one equals ten, right? One will chase a thousand, two will put ten thousand to fight, the scripture says. Matthew 18, 18, I assure you, this is the Amplified, most solemnly say to you, whatever you bind, whatever you forbid, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth, shall have already been bound in heaven, and whatever you per- loose or permit or declare unlawful in the earth shall have been already loosed in heaven. In other words, he talks about stuff happening on the earth before it happens here. So we have to forbid things. In the name of Jesus, devil, we bind you. We forbid it down here, and it's bound in the name of Jesus. There's power in binding and loosing. In fact, it's one of the ten New Testament prayers. The prayer of binding and loosing is one of the ten prayers mentioned in the New Testament. And it's when we bind the devil. Somebody said, oh, I was going to leave that up to Jesus. Well, isn't that funny? He left it up to you. He's saying, whatever you do, I, I permit It's been said this way. There's a lot of things that go on because we let them go on. 
But we need to take authority. We need to speak the word, whatever you bind. So we forbid things from happening. We bind you in the name of Jesus, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Okay, now I'm going to just kind of scan through here. One of the great scriptures that was a tremendous blessing during this season of my life was Mark 4, 35. And I'm just reading from this scripture, this booklet, just called Healing. And we can get you a copy if you don't already have one. But it's a good one to have, um, whatever you're dealing with. And the scripture says this about Jesus. On the same day when evening had come, he said unto them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him. You ever notice that passage and there were all these little other boats? You ever think whenever Jesus rebuked the storm, not only did the disciple have peace, but all these other little boats got peace? You ever think, well, you're so blessed that people around you get blessed? And they don't even know how they got blessed, but it was, it was Jesus blessed them in, 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 in this storm. So the Bible says, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that they were already feeling, filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. What was Jesus doing during the storm? You know, y'all, there's a time to stand up and rebuke, but there's a time to say, I'm, I'm resting. He that hath believed does enter into rest. I'm resting in the Lord on this deal. And so the Bible says here, he was asleep on a pillow and they awoke him and they said unto him, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? And then he arose and rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? My confession, this one was another best friend. I'm crossing to the other side of this storm in peace. How many know it's one thing to get on the other side of the storm, but God wants you to get on the other side with your brain, your mind intact. You know, oh, I'm, I'm on the other side. In other words, Jesus looked just as good on the other side of the Sea of Galilee as he looked when he started it. He was, he was in that situation, and he was, he was at rest. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Those are the words of Jesus. So we've got to stand on the word of God. Mark 16. I'm going to jump down here. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 20 says this. Well, this is a good one for people going through chemo. I'm giving you some of these because you may meet somebody. You're going to meet somebody sometime. Mark 16, 17. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. Devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. Notice this. If they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. Somebody came to me and said, Pastor, that's how I'm praying. If you drink anything deadly, it's not going to hurt you. I thought, that's a good one. How many know these things are in the scriptures? You just got to find them, right? And it was like, hey, if you, if you come across anything deadly, it's not going to hurt you. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall, what? Recover. So we have to just thank God recovery is working in my body. Everybody say that. Recovery is working in my body right now. Now, sickness, don't talk about sickness is working in my body. No, recovery is working in my body right now. Hallelujah. I'm just going to look and see if i got any more of my best friends here. John 10.10. I'm on page 14 here. John 10.10. Brought this up last week. The thief cometh only but to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Abundant in the Greek. The word abundant means super abundant in quantity and superior in quality. You know what God wants you to have? A superior in quality life. And those are right off the lips of Jesus. Come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The word abundant means superior in quality. Superior in quality health. Lord, thank you. Let's just all thank the Lord. Thank you, Father, for superior in quality health, Father, in the name of Jesus. You know, it's important that right now, who's your health care provider? Who's your, and I said this last week, but let me tell you, y'all, your health care provider is the Lord God. 
Oh, no, Pastor, I got this specialist. Well, so do I. The Lord is the greatest specialist there is. And so you need to stand on that. Here's another one of my buddies. Acts 3.16. I read this one mucho times, many, many times. And it says this, Acts 3.16. It says, in his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Notice this. In the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And that was my constant confession. Lord, Jesus, see the last line there? Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. Is that not great? Jesus, they said Jesus has given this man perfect health. And the word perfect there, health, is the word soundness in the King James. And it just means fit for use. Everything's working. Fit for use. Praise God. I'm going to stop right here and we're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just thank you tonight, Lord, for this word. And Father, I just pray for people that are here today that um, they're going to meet people and they're going to interact with people that are going through challenges. And Lord, I just thank you that this is a time where we can be equipped to help them, that we can be wise and we can be mature and we can be sensitive to help them, Lord. And I just pray, Father, God, you would help us all to have a sensitivity to your spirit, that, Father, we would be spirit-led. In Jesus' name, amen.